Uh, Juan asked me to uh, give you a talk about what's going on with gravitational wave uh, searches. And in the meantime, uh, after, after that, uh, with a bunch of people uh, shown here, we have put out uh, uh, several papers uh, reanalyzing the LIGO public. The, the data from LIGO has become public in the meantime. Um, and we reanalyzed this data. And by we, I think it's not a correct statement. Uh, the, mem the people listed here, except for me, reanalyzed this data. <laughs> I just uh, hang around, I guess. Um, and. Uh, and interestingly, the claim will be that, uh, that um, this uh, new search uh, is, twice, is sensitive to twice the volume that the LIGO search ha is uh, sensitive to, and roughly speaking. And, uh, and thus, we have uh, uncovered pretty much the same number of events that they have, in addition to the ones that they have. Um, so those are pretty bold claims, especially from people that uh, were, had, have no history in this uh, gravitational wave uh, detection field. For, from my point of view, I think it's great. Uh, it shows that uh, what the Institute is all about. People came here because, uh, for whatever the reason, we thought they were very good. They found each other. They work on something different. And uh, we, that happens to be one of the more interesting things uh, in astrophysics. And, uh, you know, put out a lot of new ideas, some of which are involved in this search, but there are papers that are not even in, uh, as part of, of, of what I'm talking here. So for, for, uh, for me, it's a great, uh, it's a great example of, uh, of how, when things go very well here at the IS. So uh, because uh, all of the people here uh, are in the audience, uh, at more or less half of the talk, I will uh, ask Barak to step up and, and, and tell you a little bit more of the details. So the plan of the of the talk is to start with an introduction, and by the time uh, we're going to discuss the actual new events and how come we, we are able to find events where, uh, where other people were not able to, um, um, I, I, Barag will, will, will uh, pick up. And uh, le I also want to mention that uh, although the LIGO Virgo data is public, this is the only external group that has decided to do this, uh, and uh, so, if anything, it w it was uh, it was a way of having an independent look at, at what the da the data was. Uh, of course, that was not our goal. Of and this and finding all of these new events uh, also was not the original goal necessarily. In fact, I thought it was impossible that we would be able to out you know. I'd maneuver people that have been working on this for such a long time. I thought this was not going to happen. And um, we wanted to just search for things that they haven't searched. As I will discuss, these searches are based on template banks. You look for certain things in the data. You build a bank of possibilities. You try to see if you find it. And there were various things, like highly spinning neutron stars or processing orbits that they hadn't looked for. And we thought that would be something we can uh, we could do, but in the in the process of doing that, uh, um, it, it it turned out that even for the standard uh, kind of searches where they've detected most of the things, the binary black holes, I think that there's uh, was significant uh, improvements to be made. So let's go to some in uh, start with some introduction first. So um, gravitational waves these days in astronomy is uh, many many branches of astronomy and cosmology are trying to go for gravitational waves from the largest uh, length scales the lowest frequencies in the cosmic microwave background to uh, learn about the early universe to ground based interferometers uh, to uh, look at uh, the merger of compact objects so this talk is about uh, about this uh, and so let's jump right, uh, right into binary systems. Uh, so, I mean, these are all things uh, people know very well, but uh, just as a reminder, and so that uh, we, we, um, we get uh, the, 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 the conventions and so on. So uh, binary systems, two masses, they're orbiting around, the, their period is given by Kepler's law, their binding energy, 
the, the power emitted in gravitational wave, the lowest order by the uh, quadruple formula of radiation. So as the system uh, orbits around, it loses energy, its uh, separation decreases, its period becomes shorter. So you, you see this, uh, or you expect this chirping signal in which the frequency of the gravitational waves, which is given by twice the orbital frequency, is increasing with time as the system loses energy. If you just take this uh, emitted power and the energy to calculate the typical time it takes for merger, uh, you find a formula like this. So the merger time is proportional to the orbital period with a very, very high power of uh, c over v. So it, it needs to be a relative, very relativistic system in order for it to merge quickly. Okay? And so in, for the case of LIGO, we are talking about uh, binary black holes or two neutron stars, which uh, are in the last uh, second or maybe even minute for the neutron stars uh, before they actually merge, and then the merger process and the ring down of the final black hole. Um, what else can I say? The, the strain, the, the size of the gravitational wave is basically given by the size of the black hole divided by the distance to the source, so it's a very small number. Um, great. So in a little bit, uh, just to set the notation then, uh, and, and give you a, a few more, a few more uh, basic uh, things. So binary system, two masses, the total mass, a mass ratio, m1 over m2, those are the things together with the spin of the black hole that determine how fast and the waveform that is being, how fast they merge and the waveform that is being emitted and when people find uh, these binary black holes and uh, they fit parameters, they determine the masses, the, the masses, the spins, that's the, 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 the observable parameters. One important parameter is the so-called chirp mass. So in terms of the mass ratio, sometimes it's useful to define this symmetric mass ratio. It's one quarter for equal mass. Um, and there is a particular combination which is quite interesting of the mass and this, uh, and this symmetric mass ratio because this uh, combination uh, at the lowest order uh, controls the amplitude of the gravitational waves and also how fast the frequency or the uh, omega of the gravitational wave is changing with time, so t equals t naught is the merger time, and, uh, but the proportionality constant is given by this uh, chirp mass, this particular combination, and it's the thing that the uh, experiments measure the best. Um, as you, um, so the amplitude then of the gravitational wave is also proportional to the chirp mass, so this is, uh, uh, in frequency, so the Fourier transform of the gravitational wave uh, waveform has this uh, roughly simple formula. Um, so it's inversely proportional to the distance. It, it's proportional to the to the chirp mass to some power. It has uh, a phase, and the phase, this chirping behavior, the phase increasing, the part, uh, the lowest order part from the quadrupole formula is of this form, also depending on the chirp mass. These exponents are very simply derived from the quadrupole formula and the amount of energy. So it's just this is the order you get from the quadrupole formula. And uh, you know, the velocity given by Kepler's law, these kind of things. Um, now this uh, amplitude of the gravitational wave going uh, like uh, uh, frequency to the minus uh, seven, six, is these formulas are true when the, the binary is sufficiently far apart. Then eventually they merge, they ring down, and, and uh, you find, uh, and then there's, uh, the system settles down. So there's a maximum frequency roughly given by the orbit, the, the frequency of going around the black hole in the last stable circular <coughs> orbit. In numbers, for a, solar, a 50 solar mass uh, black hole, it's around 100 hertz. So that's the, so, um, so that's, uh, so, that's the maximum frequency you would see for that uh, kind of heavy black holes. Um, masses are up to this. This is kind of the high, heaviest mass we w one sees in the LIGO data. Um, other other things to, uh, that are important. So if you have this binary system, the amount there are two polarizations of the gravitational wave. The amount of radiation that you get in different directions depends on your line of sight relative to the plane of the orbit, it's most uh, 
most of the radiation, it, it, it emits the most if you see the, the binary like in the plane of the sky. And th in that situation, you can see those further out because they emit a little bit more um, than if they are edge on. The two polar, if you have an interferometer like LIGO, it's not sensitive to gravitational waves equally in every direction. It has some sort of quadrupolar type pattern. Of the, so if you have a, um, an interferometer, it is sensitive to one of the polarization with a given pattern of the sky. It's sensitive with the other polarization with another pattern. If you combine these two, this is kind of the sensitivity <coughs> pattern to a uh, unpolarized gravitational wave. So you are more sensitive in one in some directions than others. But it's a it's a it's a smooth, very smooth function, also quadrupole. So it's not super fast changing in in the angles. The two LIGO detectors are more or less oriented in the same. Uh, Direction, so their patterns on the sky of sensitivity are very similar. Um, yes, w another thing that I wanted to mention, these are a little bit uh, too many formulas, but uh, one thing to mention is that then the gravitational wave has an amplitude and a phase. If you work out not just the lowest order in uh, the post Newtonian, which is what I uh, wrote down before, but you write the formula for the phase of the gravitational wave as of in powers of v over c, f over uh, the characteristic uh, frequency is v, uh, so v over c is f to the one scales like f, f frequency to the one third. Um, you get uh, you can compute and people have uh, computed how the phase changes as a function of frequency in this post-Newtonian expansion just to. Uh, point to you that uh, at the lowest order, the only thing that matters is this chirp mass. But as you go to higher and higher order, more parameters start coming in, like the, um, like the um, uh, mass ratio or the symmetric mass ratio. This beta is a spin parameter. So the, for the next thing that appears is a spin orbit coupling. Uh, and that is proportional to the amount of, of the spin of the black holes in the direction of the orbit, and so on. So more and more things appear. Just to get a sense, at the current time, uh, with the, for the events measured in LIGO, uh, with the sensitivity of LIGO, basically three parameters can be extracted from each merger, which is this chirp mass, the symmetric mass ratio, and one component of the spin, which is the component of the spin along the direction, the angular momentum of the orbit. So for the, the spin orbit coupling, that is the lowest order that appears in this expansion. In detail. Um, to predict these waveforms, especially for the heavy black holes, uh, it's very important to do numerical relativity because they are not in the regime of this PN expansion. So you, as you can see, these are the examples of the waveforms of the events detected uh, in the first uh, observing, well, the first three are in the first observing run. You only see a few cycles. This is just the very, very end. Remember, there is uh, the frequency is twice the orbital frequency. So you see two periods there for you, each orbital orbital uh, period. So, so it's not, especially these things are not very, th this is not the, a, w a good description for the neutron stars that are a lot, uh, long, long time in the detector. This is uh, much better. But it's still the case that the parameters that you can determine from the orbits are basically um, those three mainly. Uh, there are other effects, like if, the, if there's a spin component that is not aligned with the angular momentum, the orbit can precess. And that would change the amplitude with which you see the uh, gravitational waves as a function of time during the event. All of those things are there and are in very interesting, but so far uh, we haven't seen them. Um, and finally, um, just to uh, just one last uh, thing is that uh, so the amplitude of the gravitational waves scales like. Uh, like the distance, one over the distance. Uh, here it's uh, called R, sorry. Um, so if there is, um, if, if you manage to uh, improve, this is just uh, simple, just to re remember, if you manage to detect, uh, improve the, the, the minimum amplitude that a gravitational wave signal by can, uh, can uh, have so that you still detect it, if you manage to improve that, the volume scales like the cube of that. And so if you make a little bit of an improvement, you make a much bigger improvement in the volume, and thus you get a more events, which just scale like the volume. 
And so basically what uh, our claim is that we w have been able to improve the, the maximum sensitivity by 20-25% with least a, a factor of 2 in volume and 2 in the number of events. Okay, so that's the basics of uh, gravitational waves in binary systems. Um, then let me just remind you of uh, LIGO. So LIGO is a pair of interferometers. Uh, they, they, uh, well, they have been around for a very long time with successive improvements of their interferometers, but their, this generation of, uh, of, uh, of the experiment is called Advanced LIGO. The first observing run happened around 2015, uh, which is called Observing, one, observing Run 1. Um, and um, so th they are in the process of uh, um, making some observations, then closing the detector for a while, up upgrading, fixing, trying to understand what's going on with their goal to uh, reach what is called their design sensitivity. What is listed here is for the LIGO, for the LIGO interferometer, there's another one in Italy called Virgo and another one in Japan called Kagra as a function of the year. Uh, what is the distance up to which they uh, are expected to see a merger of a binary neutron star, okay? Just to have a sense. Uh, and so um, these two things already happened, and we are now, they've just turned on again, and they are observing in what's called observing run three. And uh, you can see, for example, this is a plot as a, for some random date during the observing run two and a random day during observing run three, which just started a month ago, roughly. Uh, this is the distance up to which they could observe a binary neutron star merger. Uh, this is the Virgo interferometer, one of the two LIGO interferometers at Hanford, the other one at Livingston. Okay? And you can see the improvements between, this is at 100 uh, megaparsecs already, it's more like 130 or 140 megaparsecs for Livingston in 03. Uh, Hanford went up to where Livingston was in 02. Uh, um, similarly, Virgo also improved. So, the go so they will, uh, you know, now we're going here, they stop again, and so on. So this is their, um, their progression. And as they improve, the, the rate of events uh, will, will increase. These numbers, by, by the way, are computed for neutron stars because the frequencies of the mergers are different for black holes and neutron stars. It's not the, the, both the numbers, of course, are not the same also because given that the binary, new, binary black holes are heavier, you can see them too much further out than this distance. But furthermore, the improvements, if they happen at one frequency range and not in another, the relative improvement will not always be the same. But it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, way of uh, having a sense of what's going on. Uh, the, they uh, released the, this data around uh, maybe two years ago, I don't remember. Um, but they released this, this data at the beginning of March, the O2, O2 data. Uh, and what happened, uh, uh, and, and, and this uh, is the data that is public, and this is the data that we have reanalyzed. Okay? We found an additional event here and six additional events. Um, great, so um, just a little bit of more of, uh, <coughs> of background about this uh, experiment. This is, uh, so what, uh, what uh, you do in these searches, there is a waveform for a particular event that you're trying to see if you find in the data. It depends on the intrinsic parameters of the merger, like the masses and and uh, um, spins and so on, and you move this through the data. This is a little piece of data, and you try to see if there is a place where there is a pr nice match. Of course, the, you have to zoom it out to see. Main, most of the time, you wouldn't see it by eye, but in any case, sometimes you would. But this is just all compressed, so you wouldn't see anything. But so uh, so um, okay. This noise uh, here has a certain. Uh, uh, amount of noise as a function of frequency, which is plotted here for the different detectors so that you can see. And the two takeaways from this plot that I want you to take away, or a few, are that the best frequency is about 100 or 200 hertz. Uh, it's not white noise, so this is not a constant uh, curve. And it also has a lot of lines. Um, so, but, uh, and 
between O2 and O3, there's improvement. Some of them improve more than others. There's improvements at some frequency and not another. Uh, if you look in detail, they, they uh, improve more in some frequencies than another. <coughs> Just as um, then uh, 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 as a reference, if you have one of these black holes, their maximum frequency, we said, was around a few hundred, maybe 200 hertz. So the amplitude was this a to the minus 7, 6, and cutting off here, neutron stars will cross all the way. Okay. So if you improve the sensitivity here, it's more important for neutron star searches. If you impr improve your sensitivity here, it's more important for black hole searches. OK, so those are the experiments, what they do very fast. What, uh, what have they found? So here is a, uh, a simple um, a picture produced by the LIGO collaboration where they uh, show um, the different uh, events that they had seen. For example, a binary black hole merger is shown by two, the masses of the two black holes and the mass of the black hole that form at the very end. Okay, so for each of the binary black holes that they have observed, which uh, were 10 in total, they have three points here. Okay? The other points come from other uh, stellar mass black holes that people have found and studied, not using gravitational waves, but through their electromagnetic emission. Okay? And one thing to take away from this plot uh, uh, is, first of all, the, um, the numbers of uh, black holes uh, are comparable between the two methods, and LIGO is uh, picking up, and so there will be a lot of black holes uh, soon. Most of the black holes we will uh, have found, and of course, each time they get to put three points, so it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's faster for them. Um, these are usually black holes orbited by some other star, which is giving uh, material of that star is accreting onto the black hole and producing x-rays or some, uh, and, and so you get to put one point uh, for each uh, of your measurements. Um, and, um, um, and maybe another thing to see is that roughly it looks like all the black holes found by LIGO are heavier than the ones that people have found in our galaxy and nearby. Um, and this is the same uh, for neutron stars. L LIGO has observed just one merger of a neutron star, they, and then they don't know exactly what is it that was produced. Yeah. The, this axis is nothing. It's just uh, for purposes of not mass, one solar mass, two solar mass, five solar mass, 10, 20, 40, 60. So this is two, 120, 130 solar mass black hole merging into some 50 or something black hole. So you can see uh, the black holes uh, observed before are in this range. These are heavier. That's uh, what I was trying to point out. Um, there is uh, this uh, separation between black holes and neutron stars, and it would be very interesting to see if LIGO detects events in this, uh, in this uh, place where they are separated. Uh, the remnant of the two neutron stars that merged in the LIGO falls in that uh, band. So. Um, let's see, what else? Um, um, so, and this is, uh, if you t so LIGO then observed 10 <coughs> events. Um, nine of them were uh, binary black hole mergers. Each of these plots shows time, and this is uh, frequency, and the colors in the front is just the amount of power as a function of each frequency at any particular time. And so here you can see this chirping behavior that the frequency goes up as time progresses and you get closer to the merger. This is the sign of uh, the gravitational wave. And this is the best fit uh, template waveform that, uh, that uh, corresponds to that event. And you can see the axis here is a fraction of half a second or so. This is the neutron star that is in band for much, much longer. Okay. And it does many, many more oscillations. And, um, and uh, the black holes that they've observed cover a wide range of masses. And as a result, some of them oscillate much more than others in the, in the frequency range that LIGO like Sorry, how is it? So for making this, this is not relying on the template. This is just frequency and time. Uh, now to find these specific examples, a, a bank of template was run to the data, and you know this is what uh, showed up. Uh, if you, 
it could be that something very different from this is there in the data, and if you had a template, you would find it. Of course, the, yeah, but uh, and and has not been found. So okay, what uh, what are the things that people are interested in? Uh, what can we learn from the gravitational wave observations? Let me uh, split it into uh, th this is just a very quick uh, introduction and um, things. So um, of course. Uh, um, perhaps the most uh, the, the 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 case that excites astronomers the most astronomers the most is the merger of two neutron stars. These uh, neutron stars then produce an explosion that people call a kilonova. It can be observed in all kind of uh, wave bands from gamma rays, optical, infrared, radio. People follow it. It's one of the this particular merger observed by LIGO is probably one of the most uh, uh, observe astronomical objects of this kind. Uh, there's a lot of things to learn about in detail what happens when two neutron stars merge, what kind of material comes out, with what composition, what kind of materials are nucleosynthesized after that. So, uh, so there's a lot of astrophysics uh, related to that. Um, for example, it is believed that uh, heavy elements produced by the R process are perhaps this is their site of uh, production and a lot of people are trying to see if in the details of the, the light curves of the, of the ejecta they can uh, use those to try to convince themselves that this is indeed what's going on and that you actually produce there enough uh, elements as you see in, uh, that you need produced in the universe, etc. So this is a very active uh, area with uh, connections with all kind of astrophysics. It also, um, the details of the waveform at the very end, uh, the, the, the stars deformed each other uh, through their tides. And this depends on the sizes of these stars. And so if you can pick up this effect, which at, uh, with some moderate significance they, they, they have put constraints on, you can get the size of neutron stars. And when you have many events, eventually also the size of neutron stars versus their mass. This depends on the neutron star equation of state. And this is all happening at the very high frequency parts of the gravitational wave signal. Um, other things that people have done with this event is uh, use the fact that the gamma rays arrived one and a half seconds or so, I forget, uh, after the gravitational waves. And so the speed of propagation of light and gravitational waves has to be the same to one part in 10 to the 15. So it's uh, the first measurement of the speed of uh, gravitational waves. Uh, and another thing that people are interested in doing eventually, at least uh, the first example was done with this event, is measure the distance scale, the Hubble constant. So here, for measuring the Hubble constant, you usually need some sort of standard candle, something that you know its luminosity, and then you measure the redshift. Uh, in this particular case, you can compute the luminosity kind of from first principles, except for the fact of the orientation, which uh, is a big source of error. And so in each individual event, you know more or less what is their intrinsic luminosity. You see, or the amplitude of these gravitational waves that you pre predict uh, left the source, and what, uh, what's the amplitude you observe. And from there, you infer the distance, and you have a redshift, and you can use that to measure the Hubble constant. The error of this measurement is pretty large for current, uh, current uh, standards and debates about the size of the Hubble constant, which require measuring the Hubble constant more like with one kilometer per second per megaparsec. But you can think that as, as you have, uh, after you have many of these events, it, given that uh, ideally this, uh, you know how to calculate this from first principles, and it's a in first principle standard candle, maybe you will average down these errors and get to one kilometer per second per megaparsec after a few, what, 100 more events or so. Another, another uh, very interesting uh, target that has not yet been observed is, um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, let me go for here. I was going to, I thought I had uh, uh, neutron star black hole mergers. But uh, the, the, the bulk of, them, of the events uh, in LIGO were binary black hole mergers. And here the puzzle, uh, the astrophysical puzzle that people are trying to figure out is what is the origin of these binaries, okay? What is the reason for that puzzle? Is that um, if you ask the question, if you have two black holes, uh, how, l how close they have to be in order for them to r lose energy by gravitational radiation fast enough that they would merge in the age of the universe, you discover a number like 
30 solar radii or something. This depends on the mass, but let's keep some number, uh, some number uh, in, you know, to keep a number in the back of your mind. But the sizes of stars, stars, uh, so, so uh, to, to um, form a black hole, so this is a plot of a mass, uh, the mass of the black holes that were observed by LIGO. Each of them is uh, uh, one of the LIGO events, so tens of solar mass uh, black holes. If you want to have a tens of solar mass black hole, you need a very massive star to start with, many tens of solar masses. And if you ask the question, how big do these stars get during their lifetime, they are much bigger when they are uh, giants. They are much bigger than this separation. So you, you cannot start with two stars because uh, you need the two black holes. Or if you start with two stars, the stars are separated by much more than the distance needed for the two black holes to emit sufficient gravitational radiation to uh, merge um, in any reasonable time. And so uh, the question is, how did you bring, how were these two black holes, how did they come together? Uh, and there are many scenarios and ways of doing this. Um, another thing that uh, perhaps is uh, useful to get, uh, to have a sense of the numbers, um, if you ask the question, so this is, uh, these are two plots. Uh, let's uh, start with this one. Ask the following question. Uh, you take all the stars that you observe in the universe, and you, roughly speaking, uh, uh, try to count, given the low mass stars that you see, how many very massive stars there are. Um, and given that, you ask the question in order to see the rate of, uh, of um, events that LIGO sees, with what efficiency do I have to take this, uh, these uh, stars that are being produced in the universe to put them together to form a black hole binary that will merge in the age of the universe? And the rough number is 1%. So you need to take, of all the black holes that you ever produce in the universe, you need to take 1% of them and bring them close enough so that they will uh, merge in the LIGO band. And then, as a result, you have two choices given this 1% uh, efficiency. Either you can try to form these uh, black holes everywhere, so all the massive stars, a fraction of around percent or so of them, go through some process that brings them together. Or uh, it's, a, it's a process that only happens in a special environment, uh, like very uh, dense uh, stellar systems. And then the efficiency has to be closer to 100% because those special systems maybe are 1% of all the stars. So you're looking for trying to distinguish the, the, the peop people that have come up with scenarios uh, that, you know, I'll break them down into, um, into uh, categories. One of them, something that happens for regular binary stars, even if they start much further out, then one of the stars becomes a black hole. The other one becomes a giant. It engulfs this black hole. This black hole migrates in closer to the center of the other star, then it unbinds this envelope and explodes. Then the second star explodes, and it forms the other black hole. This is a scenario number one, let's call it, a class of scenario number one which is a scenario that happens for all binary stars, and then you need efficiencies of percent of the cases to merge, uh, to, to get so close, and uh, uh, because you're doing it to every star. This is this kind of. So this is an example in one of these scenarios. You start with the two stars. They become giants. They, they transfer mass, blah, blah, blah. At each stage, this is a figure from one of these papers. What is happening? What is happening? Eventually, they end, you end up with two black holes. But it looks like a very complicated song and dance, which nobody can calculate pretty much anything about the different states. Looks, it's not, uh, or maybe it's an overstatement that nobody can calculate, but it's very difficult to understand exactly what, what's going on. And other more clean examples is you start with black holes in a dense system like a globular cluster, and then they go triple scatterings of multiple stars uh, and so on until they bound together, and then they, you start uh, exchanging energy with all these other stars that are around by scattering and shrinking the orbit. That's a very clean uh, physics problem that people can solve in the computer. And that's uh, uh, another type of scenario. Um, the, but this scenario requires that the efficiency is very high because these very uh, dense systems are rare. So, and people want to distinguish between these uh, these uh, scenarios by studying the properties of these binaries, in particular, for example, the rate at which things happen or the masses that you see, 
all of these different examples makes different predictions for this. For example, an easy one which is, um, which is um, relevant for the observations at the moment is the spin of the black hole, the orientation of the two spins. In an example like this, where you form the two black holes independent of each other, and they are moving around, and eventually they capture, and so on, the, the orientation of the spins and the orbit are completely random. So in these examples, spins of direction of spin of the black hole and direction of the orbital angular momentum have no relation with each other. No, the spin orbit, no, it doesn't. Uh, only happens, yeah, no, there is no. Um, for this example, where things uh, uh, um, form together, there are significant tides between them. They are very close to each other during uh, big parts of, uh, of their history. They might get tidally locked. The press, when, in the moment when you have a black hole and a star, the tide of the black hole can uh, tidally lock the star, like the Earth and the Moon system. And so you will end up having a spin. of. Then this one con uh, converts into a black hole, and it will be spinning. But the spin remembers about the orbit. So in these kind of examples, the spin and the orbit are related. Uh, so these are there, there, there are various uh, things that people have worked out uh, to try to distinguish between the formation scenarios, of which I only gave two examples. But, uh, um, um, and so in this, in this situation, at the current time, we would like to understand this puzzle of where these black holes formed. Uh, we are, uh, um, at the moment, uh, starved by the numbers. We only have a few examples, and we are trying to, to, uh, to see uh, if we can figure this out. And in this context, it's interesting to see um, if you can have more events, then it becomes perhaps uh, better to sort some of these things out, or you find some special example or something like that that can give you a clue. Um, um, finally, um, this is um, a plot of the parameters, the combined parameters of all the events that LIGO had announced. This Q is the mass ratio, so bottom line, uh, all of the uh, LIGO black holes, the mass ratio is not very well constrained, and is, but is typically consistent always with one. Equal masses is a good description. We, they haven't seen an example with a very different uh, uh, mass ratio. Um, and then, um, so the, this plot here, the x-axis is the chirp mass, the y-axis in the top plot is the mass ratio, and in the bottom plot is the, what, what people call chi effective, which is just the component of the spin in the direction of the orbit. So if you call z the angular momentum of the orbit, if you call z the angular momentum of the orbit, this combination is just mass 1 times the spin of the black hole 1, mass 2, spin of the black hole 2 in that direction, and m is the total mass. Okay, So it's just the one parameter which is best constrained that uh, tells you about the spin orbit coupling and, uh, and, um, and um, the data already has uh, something to say about it. I in particular, two things to notice here. I've plotted the uh, um, or Javier really plotted here, um, uh, mass, chirp mass, and uh, these, these dots here are, are X-ray binaries. So black holes that have been observed in the ele uh, electromagnetically in our galaxy, and from the details of how the material is falling onto this black hole, people have inferred the spin of this black hole, and they have, uh, there's some claimed spin, which tend to, to be high, okay? So, before LIGO, we had no black holes, and we had a few examples with very high spin, and they all had uh, low mass. So this is the so low mass, high spin. After LIGO, much heavier ones. This is something that was immediately noticed uh, at the very beginning, and it made uh, it made uh, news, in, uh, and uh, not so spinning. Okay. So it looks different from the ones that we see in our galaxy. There are some examples which, have, uh, which had a spin which was not consistent with zero, but roughly speaking, low spin and heavy. That was the conclusion after, of the LIGO events. These are the collection of all the black holes from 01 and 02 observing runs. Um, and uh, finally, 
Uh, another thing that people are awaiting uh, with uh, much anticipation is to see if the uh, LIGO would observe the merger of a neutron star and a black hole. This might also give us clue about the formation scenarios. Uh, people have been, just as they have uh, done for the case of binary neutron stars, trying to understand what are the electromagnetic counterparts, uh, etc. So this is, but uh, we have not yet, uh, LIGO has not yet uh, detected any example. So with that, that is, I think is uh, my introduction. And with that, I will ask uh, Barak to tell you a little bit about uh, our search and what, what, what we have done. OK. Uh, so I'm Barak. I'm a, I'm a member here for the past year and a half. Um, Matthias already introduced the team. We are working shoulder, shoulder to shoulder on this, the entire team. So. Um, well, Matthias also presented the bottom line that we have a full-fledged analysis uh, for detecting gravitational waves. The, the original goal was not the uh, goal written here, but we got to the goal written here once we understood that it's possible to reduce the background and look to fainter signals. Um, we found one new event in 01 and six new events in 02. Um, we took the approach to have a blank slate, um, except for the uh, computation of the waveforms, which we do exactly like LIGO is doing. We just took their package, we took their waveforms. In, in every step of the pipeline, we either have a completely new, ap new approach or a code of our own to the same approach. Okay? Uh, so the red things are things in which we have substantial changes from the LIGO pipeline and the blue things are just new implementations. Things that we have new implementations but they exist in the LIGO pipeline. Um, so what are the steps in, the, in, the, in such a search pipeline? So you need to have some waveforms. From these waveforms the parameters are continuous but we have finite computation. So we, find we need to have some discrete template bank. In Except for that, we also need to uh, search for these discrete template banks. So in order to do that, we have to uh, estimate the detector noise and deal with its non-stationarity. If we have time, we will deal with this in a little bit more detail. And we also have to detect places in which the detector is not behaving very well, that are essentially unusable. Even if there is an event there, you cannot, you, you cannot claim it. So what's the point of keep it, keeping it inside? In you have to match filter every, every, every template you have. Uh, you have to figure out, let's say that you have something, you have to figure out what is its significant. Um, you have to find triggers between two detectors. You have to match them up make sure they are, they are uh, coherent. And also we have, you have to estimate the background of the search. When so. When you're going to search waveforms? What? What did you do here that they did not do? Why, why, essentially, why didn't they do that? Uh, well, if you look at the definition of steps for their pipeline, you would also have a list like this. Uh, the Things on the red are things in which we have done some things substantially differently. We will get into the details of at least one of them, if, if time would permit. And if time would permit further, we will see another. In the, the bottom line is maybe a, in, uh, what is it that we have done that they did not? We, I have many answers to this question, but uh, this total factor of two insensitivity is mainly due to three things. We have here something that would increase the sensitivity by 10% by uh, re recognizing a phenomena in the data that we could correct for completely and they did not recognize it or correct for it, uh, depending on the pipeline you refer to. Um, this approach in which we remove bad segments of data, they practically did not do it. They tried to keep all the data in, even though there are places that are complete, uh, 
total loss. Um, and we have substantial changes in, in, in other parts. So I, I don't know how to. Uh, so for example, uh, if, if you have uh, something and you want to ask yourself, is this a gravitational wave or not, we have a step that would uh, make a very aggressive consistency checks that reduce by orders of magnitude the uh, contamination from the thing that they call blip glitches. And in the higher masses, this is a particularly important part of the analysis. Did I answer your question? I tried. I tried. <laughs> uh, OK. Um, so the new events that we are finding are all of the heavy type. Um, the, the heaviest type, we have here a substantial more yield, especially because of this treatment of the, of the glitches. Um, what else I can say? Um, we okay, maybe this is the maybe this is the plot. So there are two detectors. Uh, each signal you detect in the two detectors, you can attribute some significance per detector. So this would be the SNR squared, something which is supposed to be some pure exponential in uh, in uh, in, uh, in Gaussian noise. And you have two detectors, the Hanford detector and the Livingstone detector. So each event, let's say this event, ha it was detected both in Hanford and in Livingstone. In Hanford, it was uh, SNR squared, I don't know, 90, and this one, 100. Okay. Now, if you look at the at the background distribution, okay, of our search, that this thing is way up there. Y you can calculate what is the leakage from outside. There's a not in the age of the universe, this thing is real. Okay, this cannot be like an artifact. Now, you, th those are the events detected by the LIGO Virgo collaboration. Um, we are cleaning the, the background substantially better. So, this detection limit for the LIGO Virgo collaboration, it's, it's actually very hard to estimate what is the actual de the detection limit. This event, they barely it barely made it into their list. So from scaling from this event and the null detection of this, we kind of drew a curve that we believe is the overestimate of, of the sensitivity of their pipeline. In, and those are the new events that we are declaring. Okay. In, well, so this blue event is a, is a, has three detectors. So here, so for most of O2, there were two detectors. Uh, for uh, one over for 15 percent of O2, there was a third detector, uh, the Virgo detector, and this one has also the Virgo detector. Without the Virgo detector, the LIGO collaboration did not announce this, and when combining the Virgo detector, they did announce this. Very good question. Yes. Now, not. 30 minutes from now, you, you in my office, I can show you whatever spectrogram you want. Uh, I must also say that if you take the spectrogram of this guy, you just don't see anything. <laughs> the the, the seeing, the, seeing the signal in the spectrogram is very well here. Maybe here you see something. Here, OK, you, I can show you the thing, but you would see a blue screen. It's not a. The data is clean. They, they pass the test of the data is clean in and around the event. Yes. Um, so if you try to estimate from this scale some, some sensitive volume, this is what you get for the, for the LIGO collaboration. Here there is the sensitivity ratio between the detector. So for each search, there is a minimal requirement from what you see in one detector. This is because the and this glitchiness of the detector, even if your pipeline is very good, it would run away in the end. So this thing, if there was only Gaussian noise, there is absolutely no way to get a point over here that is, that is not real. But the, the, even with our pipeline, we still have some glitchiness remaining. So you see things like this. So you have to have some, some indication from the other detector that this thing is, is real. Otherwise, you cannot announce it. Um, 
So the ratio of sensitivity between the detectors actually matter for your volume. So if, if the detectors are symmetric, most of the events would lie here. And then it would be very easy to, to announce them because you compete with this. But if the detectors are very asymmetric, mo most of the events appear here. And then it's very hard to, to announce them because if you, if you don't meet the requirement from the, from, the, from the weaker detector, then you, you don't pass the bar. In, so this is the estimate of the volume for, the, for, the, for this blue line. And this is the estimate for the volume for our, for our search. In, There is, a, there, is a, there is a nomenclature. So if, if I know that an event has, so for this guy, I can compute that it's 80% of astrophysical origin. Is it an event or a candidate? What is it? What? Nothing over up to the event. So that's why I wonder. LIGO is calling them events. We can also call them events in that sense. But there's a, there's a guy here. Formally, I have to report it. It's 50%. If you, can I, can I? It's like flipping a coin, if it's real or not. It also has some very weird parameters. I don't want to bias myself. I have to report it. But do I think it's a real event? Maybe, maybe not. 50-50. So you can call it a candidate or an event. It's a nomenclature. In the end, what you get is a list of events and the contamination probability for each one of them that we report with the event. The, the people who make an inference out of it are big kids. Our big kids, the, they can responsibly understand the uncertainty. Um, OK. So uh, those are the, this is the, where is it? This is the new guy in, in 01. Uh, we, we'll talk about it a little bit more later. Uh, these are the new guys in 02. Um, Three of them are very are very uh, secure, so you can't just uh, you can't just say that these things you can't uh, shrug them off. They they are very secure. Three of them are kind of borderline. You can call them events or candidates or whatever you want. Triggers. Uh, officially, LIGO calls them events, which we can use the events nomenclature. In in terms of what can you learn from these new events, yeah, so the, the LIGO events are here in blue. This is uh, the total mass in the source frame and the chi effective, okay, the, the, this effective spin. And we color the events by the probability that they are real. So this is an unsure event with very weird parameters. You can do whatever you want with, with this statement, but we have to show it. In, those are the secure guys. Uh, an interesting point, two interesting points are uh, this thing has some uh, negative spin. So this means that the black, that the effective spin that you measure for the system is the other way. It's not all orbiting with the same sense of rotation as the orbit. Um, this is not expected from, uh, from a, a regular uh, stellar evolution unless you invoke some very nasty kick to the orbit, which is a very problematic thing. Um, and this guy, which is also uh, some 70%, so take it with a grain of salt. But this thing, the data actually supports a, an effective spin of one. Um, so in terms of uh, the data cannot produce a point that is a higher. <laughs> so with this SNR, if you put a, a something that spins with a spin of one, that's how it looked like, OK, as a point in the graph. In, and this spin of one is like both black holes spin, spinning exactly with the maximal spin with the same sense of rotation of the orbit. So this is a very fine-tuned configuration. So if you want to fight with with this, it's better to say that it's a glitch than to try to play with the geometry of the thing. In, so this is uh, something that is very hard to explain, and you have to, to invoke some, in, some good argument to explain. Yeah? Did, did you run into that with the Newton uh, 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 Yeah. Well. 
this thing is a more negative in terms of, so this is a sure point, and this thing is a, with probability bigger than 95% actually negatively spinning. So there's a, there's a thing to it. It begins to be hard to ignore the existence of all these negative points. Previously to, to these detections, it would have been possible to say that this is just unlucky thing, and it was negatively spinning because you put zero, you, you get some measurement, maybe it's negative, maybe it's positive. And now it's, it begins to be hard. We are trying to do the, Javier is doing the population uh, analysis to see if there's evidence now to, to say firmly that black holes in nature are negatively spinning. In, is that the question? The mass range is kind of the same, yeah. They didn't find it because they have background at the same level of significance that these, that these. Uh, so at the same power, if you want, in H and L detector, you would find in their analysis points in which they have glitches of unexplained origin that lie in the distribution of background. So they cannot see through the background these new events. Is that a good answer? Um, Yes, um, we've said it already that the O1, the O1 discovery has the highest spinning system so far. It's in fact cannot be highest. The, the data cannot produce something more highly spinning. You wanted a spectrogram. I have spectrogram for one event, for the O1 thing. And I, I don't know what you see here, but you don't see a dramatic glitch going, telling you that it's completely junk. What you see is a faint thing that you need exact statistics in order to claim that this thing is real or not real. Yeah, okay. I was wondering like on the anchor spectrogram. Yes. It looks like there are some other things like similar objects. This? Yeah, it looks like there are some other things like similar objects. This? Yeah, If you open the data, just go over, skim it. In every few seconds, you would see something like this. It's, it's this incoher these incoherent plots are kind of misleading because if it is very, very loud, you would see something in power. But the real statistical significance lies in the fact that you can integrate all these cycles coherently. So all these complex numbers are not adding in amplitude. They are amp so what you see here is the amplitude by I. They are not adding in amplitude. They are adding in phase. So addition in phase is much more sensitive than addition in amplitude. So this. This thing, this diagnostic is just, just to see that you're not crazy, that there's no shouting thing from the data, okay? Um, I hope I answered the question. Uh, we are kind of, uh, um, we have talked about this, let's just. Um, so what are the differences you ask? I don't know if, I, if we would have time. I, I think two minutes that are not enough to, to present even a single stage. Um, let's talk about the, let's try to explain one thing. Uh, so one effect that we have seen in the data that they did not, or did not account for, or did not correct for, um, is the uh, PSD drift. So you have s some template of a, of a gravitational wave, you have this uh, PSD, the power spectral density of the data. Uh, in order to, to make a detection, you have to have a detection statistic. This is the match filtering detect detection statistic. Usually it is presented alone, but you, you should really present it with, as a full formula because you have to normalize it by the expected standard deviation. And the, uh, the easiest thing to explain is the following. Let's say that this PSD is a measured value. It has a mistake built into it because you measured it from the data. It is also changing on time scales of tens of seconds. We have evidence for that. Um, so let's just assume that we measure the wrong PSD. What happens to the score if you measure the wrong PSD? So you go, you go by, you calculate this. And now, first thing to note, if you, have, if you want to add A to B or X1 to X2, and you are forced to do it by mistake with a, with a wrong coefficient, how much did you lose in the SNR? This is a trivial question because if the optimal addition is one to one, 
and it's a maximum, then the loss would be O of epsilon squared. That's very intuitive. Yeah, but this is only if you uh, normalize the result correctly. If you don't normalize the result correctly, if you look at the full formula, there's a mistake both here and here from using the wrong PSD. If you look at, the, at this part of the, of the formula, the loss is actually order epsilon. Now this epsilon for, for, the, for the data that we are talking about is of order 10%. So, so what? So you have a misestimated standard deviation by 10%. This doesn't sound so, so bad. But actually, this is very bad. Why is, why is it very bad? Because what is the most efficient way to create a 10 sigma trigger? It turns out that e to the minus 100 over 2 and e to the minus 60 over 2 are very far apart. And if 1% of the data have a misestimation of the standard deviation by 40%, it's way, way, way easier to create a a hundred this way than to create it with Gaussian noise. Okay, so that so th this is just before and after this correction. In this is also not the whole story. So this is a bank with this is a piece of the uh, templates that have very long waveforms and details. So they are not so it is not so glitchy. In, but if you ha if you look at very heavy black holes, then this is not the whole part of the story. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that's easy to explain. Um, I think we are over time now, so let's just go to the summary. Yes. Um, so the summary is that we still don't know what is the origin of these binary black holes, but when you obtain more data, more events, more diversity of these things, you begin to have handle on on this formation mechanism. For example, negative spin or positive spin are very clear signatures of different formation me mechanisms. In, at this point, it's also very important to say that the fact that the, da the LIGO data is available gives the, the uh, external observing groups opportunity to analyze the data independently. This is very important. The, I think this is already acknowledged in astronomy that it's extremely important for all of the surveys to release the, the data. In the public, the, the greater scientific community have done marvels with other kinds of data, for example, Kepler data or Fermi data. Now the LIGO data is also joining the group of people, of signals in which observing, external observing groups made substantial contribution to the analysis. In, in we estimate that our pipeline doubled the sensitive volume. Just to put it in scale, the whole upgrade from O2 to O3 is doubling the sensitive volume. So this is not to be, sh you can't just wait for another observing run. It's a, it's a critical thing. In, we have found one, one new event in O2, one new event in O1, six new events in O2. In, in these events are, some of them are very interesting, some of them are just in, out of central casting for binary black holes. In, and O3 has started. In, we think it would be very beneficial for the community if somehow a political way would be found such that the, our analysis would find its way to run on the O3 data. In, either this way or the other, I think it's important. That's it.